Hello and welcome to the semester two CardioSoc ECG tutorial. Uh, in this tutorial, we're going to go through uh, a number of bits of information about ECGs, how to read and how to interpret, uh, and recognizing patterns that will lead you to developing a differential uh, based off an ECG and some other bits as well. So. To get started, just to do a little bit of basic physiology, as we all know, the heart has its conduction pathway starting from the SA node, AV node, bundle of his right and left bundle branches, protein G fibers, and then the ventricles. Um, so that's just really important to keep in mind as we are looking at our ECGs and looking at which waveforms are being formed by the depolarizations happening in these cell types. Uh, so, for instance, the SA node and the depolarization of the atria is related to P waves, but we'll get into that. So just keep uh, in mind what the conduction system is. We're just going to get right into looking at our ECG. If you look at our previous tutorial or some of our other videos um, on YouTube, you'll get a little bit more information about the logistics of how to place your leads and electrodes and what that does. But for the purpose of this tutorial, we're just going to go right in and start to look at understanding what the ECG printout looks like. So what we're trying to paint uh, here is a picture of the 12 views and how they come to be from the leads that we have. So what's important to know is you have uh, limb leads, uh, which are leads one, two, three, and then the augmented leads, which are AVR, AVL, and AVF. And altogether, those leads make up this vertical plane that you're seeing here. Um, and just for reference, like in that plane, if you think about it, uh, you can see one and AVL here are, are to the left. And so these are kind of, these have been deemed the lateral leads because your electrode here is kind of facing on the lateral side. So all of the of the conductance information that's coming from the heart that's being read by AVL and lead one are coming, you know, facing laterally. Uh, so you can think of those as your lateral leads. And then similarly, the inferior leads in this vertical plane as well are two, three, and AVF down here. Uh, and those ones are similar to the similar concept to AVL and lead one. They're underneath if you will their inferior place so all of the the way that they're looking at the heart is from the bottom so that kind of gives you some idea of which areas of the heart are viewed if you will by by these leads uh, and then you have our horizontal plane which is generated by ch chest leads of which there are six v1 through v6 uh, and those sit right on the chest wall you can see from this image, we're looking at the red circle here and like the red arrows, V1, V2, V3 are really on the anterior side and then you're moving more lateral as you're getting to V4, V5, V6. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the ECG as well when we see the printout that, you know, V5 and V6 are also in the lateral position. One, two, three, four are kind of anterior septal, so we will get into that. But this is just giving you an idea of the territory being covered by each of the individual leads. This is just a note that I like to make because it's really helpful when we get to access deviation a little bit later. But um, ECGs, as you know, they, they have lines that go up and lines that go down. So these are the positive and negative deflections um, of uh, the electrical activity that is being read by each electrode. Uh, and this has a really good way of thinking about it. So this wave of depolarization, right, because we know a lot of our cardiac um, electrical activity is conducted by positive ions. So imagine these are, you know, a group of positive ions. So what this image is showing and what the whole concept of the slide is trying to say is a wave of depolarization, a wave of positive energy moving toward an electrode like this one here is going to read as a positive deflection on your ECG. So anytime you see a, a deflection that goes up, uh, you can know for sure that that is a depolarization in that lead going towards it. Uh, the opposite is true as you see like this wave of, of positive energy that's moving away from this electrode is going to show up as a negative deflection 
Uh, so that is kind of the opposite of, of what we had said before. And so the heart is 3D, uh, so particularly um, we have leads that are placed around the chest and, and on other parts of the torso. So none of they're not all either facing depolarization or facing away from depolarization. So these leads here, these electrodes here that I'm highlighting kind of are all along that wave of depolarization. So you can see depending on what the orientation is to the direction of the depolarization. You get these split waves with positive and negative components to them. Um, and the closer you get to the front of the wave of depolarization, you can see there's more positive than there is negative uh, deflection in, in the lead. So that's just a, a way to think about it. This is really important, particularly when we're looking at our QRS complexes, because those will be the highest amplitude of depolarization or the highest amplitude of deflection off of the isoelectric baseline. So that's kind of something to keep in mind, and it'll certainly be very helpful when we do axis deviation in a little bit. So let's just knock it back to basics and talk about um, what you're looking at when you're looking at an ECG. So the first thing to keep in mind is the paper. <laughs> uh, so the paper tells us a lot. Um, uh, I'll just tell you now, the entire run of your ECG is 10 seconds long. Uh, and it's comprised of both large and small squares. So this is a really good breakdown. Uh, you'll see that each sm large square is comprised of four smaller boxes. So this is really good to remember that e one small box is 0 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds. Uh, and then one large box is, right, five small ones. So you get um, 0 0.2 seconds from one large box uh, and five large boxes is one second. So these are all really useful when it comes to, to determining the rate, determining the length of certain intervals. You can count the number of boxes uh, and you can kind of have a really good system on, on how long a certain in interval in your ECG is taking. So just remember one small box is 0.4 seconds or 40 milliseconds. One large box is, is 0.2 seconds or 200 milliseconds. Uh, and that's all based off of the paper speed of your ECG, which just for your information is 25 millimeters per second on the horizontal axis. So those are all things to keep in mind um, and things that you should know that will help you in understanding your ECG moving forward. So, like I said at the very beginning, each um, heart cell, um, both the nodal cells and to some extent the myocytes, are have electrical activity, um, and they are, and the depolarization in these segments is indicative of the waveforms in your ECG. So uh, I just have a, a good image here that kind of goes back to the image I showed before. Uh, and you can see, you know, the SA node here in green, right? Um, that's showing you the green and like the depolarization that goes through the atria is similarly colored green here where you see the P wave. Uh, and you could kind of get the sense of which parts of the conduction system are responsible for the waveforms and that's just listed out here your p wave is atrial depolarization the pr interval um is the time from the start of the of atrial depolarization until ventricular depolarization begins um qrs complex is ventricular depolarization usually that fast big spike big positive or your uh, deflection that you see on the ecg uh, the J point is important and comes into play uh, when we talk about ST elevation, but it's the point um, in the S at the beginning of the ST segment that reaches that isoelectric base point. Like I said, ST segment is the isoelectric base point. Um, and that is, uh, if we're talking about ion conductance as well, uh, as we know, when the heart starts to repolarize, repolar potassium channels open, and there's potassium efflux um, that brings down the electrical potential, but then at some point, calcium channels also open and calcium comes into the cell. So there's this um, plateau phase in your ion conductance, and so that's very similar, or that lines up with the ST segment. And then T waves is ventricular repolarization, and then the another important thing to keep in mind is the QT interval, which is um, essentially represents systole, so the beginning of ventricular depolarization until 
the end of repolarization um, and QT interval is important particularly, I mean, a lot of um, medications and, and drugs have uh, QT effects or can cause arrhythmias, so that's something important to know, but um, there's also, you know, different pathologies where long or short QT can occur, so just knowing the corrected QT or QTC um, is 440, some, 440 for, for females and 460 for males, just so that you know uh, QT is also important to look at. So we don't always look at it, but if it looks long, then you might want to calculate your QTC. <laughs> okay, so, so just to break down a little bit about your ECG, uh, so this is what a printout normally looks like. It has all of your leads. So on the left side, you have all of the um, limb leads. So the limb leads and the augmented leads, leads one, two, three, and then AVR, AVL, AVF. And then on the right of the printout is the chest leads V1 through V6. And very commonly on the bottom, you have this um, rhythm strip, which is a, it, it's a continuous read of lead two. And so that gives you like more of a constant picture. The rhythm strip is not a simultaneous read, but it is recorded uh, continuously. And so that's really helpful when we talk about determining rate and like looking for, for certain patterns. Okay, so let's get right into the six step method because that's going to be the bread and butter. So the whole point of having the, using the six step method or why we often teach it here in CardioSoc is because it, ECGs can be kind of complicated, but if you have a system, then they're easy to at least digest and you can start to recognize the patterns and, and do things that way. Uh, so our six steps are determining the rate, determining the rhythm, looking at the P waves, looking at the QRS complex, um, calculating the PR interval, and then looking at the morphology of the ST segment. So using those six steps, you will most likely be able to find some patterns that will lead you to uh, a pathology or a differential or kind of an answer for what's being shown in that ECG. So step one of the six step method is the rate. Um, and I've just included normal rate of uh, 60 to 100 beats per minute. And then, you know, bradycardia is determined as less than 60 and tachycardia is determined as greater than 100 beats per minute. So uh, if you're looking at and you have a rate, you know, you determine your rate, you can very quickly call it uh, if it's a normal rate or if it's a tachy or a bradycardia, you can definitely uh, get that out. How does one calculate the rate? So like I said before, the speed of your ECG paper is 25 millimeters per second. Um, and we know um, based off of that also, you know, our large boxes are 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds and each of the small boxes is 0.04 seconds. So using the speed of the paper um, and that determination, there are two ways that you can calculate the rate. This is showing you the 300 method, which is a really easy shorthand on how to do it. Um, so if there's one big box between your uh, R peak of your QRS interval here and here, this is 300 beats per minute. Um, Two big boxes in between, it's 300 divided by two, so 150, and so on and so forth. So getting using this 300 method is really nice and easy, uh, and the formula for it is 300 divided by the um, number of large squares in your RR interval, and so that can be really helpful in a quick way to determine your rate. So I'll show you an example here of what that kind of looks like. So uh, here you want to identify two consecutive R waves, then count the number of large boxes between them and then divide by 300. So we have an R wave here, and that's really nice because it lands on the line of a big box. <laughs> And then your second R wave is here, kind of halfway in between. So in between this R wave, you have one, two, three, four, and this is kind of, this is the fifth box, so like we'll call it 4.5, right? Um, and so all we have to do now is do a little bit of math. And we said it's 300 divided by the number of boxes, which we said is 4.5. Um, and that should give us a pretty good estimate of what the rate is in this, which is about 66 beats per minute. Um, and so that's a nice, quick, easy way to interpret the rate. The caveat of determining the rate this way is that 
it can only be used with regular rhythms, so it can be kind of tricky if you have an irregular rhythm or if you're unsure if the rhythm is regular or not. Um, this can kind of not work out so well. There is another way to determine the rate called the, the 10 second method. Um, and like I said before, E, the entire ECG printout is 10 seconds, so I don't have a whole one here with me, but um, if you imagine the entire um, ECG is 10 seconds, in that 10 seconds, there'll be an, a fixed number of R peaks. Uh, and so for the 10 second method, what you have to do is you just count the number of R peaks in the entire printout. Um, so this isn't a full printout, but bear with me. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, which is going to be quite slow. So let's say it's seven in 10 seconds. In order to get your beats per minute, this is beats in 10 seconds. If you want beats per minute, you just multiply it by six and that'll give you 60 seconds and that'll give you beats in 60 seconds, which is beats per minute. Um, uh, this is 42. Anyway, that's not quite right because this isn't quite 10 seconds, but I'll show you an example of how to use the 10 second method. The benefit of the 10 second method is you can use it for any rhythm at all. It's good for irregular or regular rhythms. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit faster if you haven't like memorized the three, the kind of formula for the 300 uh, method uh, with how many boxes you have to divide. But uh, you can use either one of them, but remember for the 300 method, you have to have a regular rhythm. 10 second method you can use for any rhythm at all. So let's talk about rhythm. Um, and it's interesting that rhythm comes second, but I think it's just easy to calculate the rate just from the jump. Uh, this is just a framework just to kind of give you an idea, showing you that you know, when it comes to rhythm, there's regular rhythms and there's irregular rhythms. So that's kind of what we're looking for. This has a really nice image of different regular and irregular rhythms divided by or separated by wide or narrow complex QRS. Um, so that's actually a really good framework to know, but we'll show you another way to determine your rhythm nice and easy. Uh, so the question for rhythm is, is the rhythm regular or is it irregular? And so the, that boils down to, is there the same distance between the R peaks of your QRS complex throughout the entirety of the ECG? Um, and so here, if you're looking at this one here, we have three R peaks. Um, and the kind of question here is to say, is the distance between this R peak and this R peak the same as the distance between the second and the third? Uh, and whether you, I, I, this works really well on the iPad and I'll show you in some examples later, but even if you have a piece of paper on the wards and you could just mark two or three R peaks on the ECG and just slide them over, you can see if they line up um, almost exactly and you can see that they do here like the red dots that I've put here on the first two peaks are lining up with the second two peaks so you can say with confidence that the rhythm is regular that those beats are occurring in the same um, time frame uh, same time frame after each other uh, irregular rhythms will not look like that so you'll definitely be able to tell and certainly with AFib we'll talk about that a little bit later irregularly irregular rhythms kind of have a lot of chaos and they don't look regular at all so, you so you'll almost directly be able to spot that out on the ECG but it's always really nice to just plot it out and just see if they are lining up or if there is a pattern to the irregularity that gives you an idea of um, what the differential might be. So P waves are next. This is a nice picture to sh just to show you a couple of the different morphologies for P waves. But the questions for P waves are short and sweet. You're looking at the duration, uh, just about three small squares. Is it a smooth kind of positive deflection in, in the P wave? <laughs> Um, and then the other question, I, I usually ask this, we have some no notes as well on amplitude here, which I think is uh, less so important. Um, but the other thing to kind of ask you, ask yourself when you're looking for P waves is, um, is there a QRS complex that follows it? So that's just trying to say for every P wave, there's a QRS and that's just determining that there's normal conductance patterns from the SA node and the atria into the AV node before you get into the ventricles. Uh, so that's another thing to kind of think of in your P waves. Looking at the QRS complex, we've, complexes, we've also included some images of different um, QRS morphologies. 
Uh, but the QRS complex should always be narrow. Oh, that's so normal for them to be narrow. That would be less than 120 milliseconds or like it says here, less than um, 0 0.12 seconds. Uh, this is also easily remembered. This has to be less than three small boxes on the ECG. Um, and narrow just indicates that the ventricular depolarization is proceeding along the appropriate pathway. Now, in some pathologies, you can get wide QRS complexes that are greater than 120 milliseconds. So um, that should be a clue or a hint that there's something going on. So the or this often means that the origin of the ventricular depolarization is happening within the ventricles and it's not passing through the AV node from the atria. Um, so that's uh, an important thing to note. Uh, and then I kind of said this in the last part, but like the relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex, you can kind of look, do this in the step before with P waves or at this stage. But the idea is to have this one-to-one -one relationship of like one P wave, one QRS complex, and then you have that pattern moving forward. <laughs> Next is the PR interval, um, and just to kind of zoom in and show you here, the PR interval is this distance right here, so beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. The PR segment um, is something different, so just don't get those mixed up as you're going through stuff. But um, the PR interval, uh, like I said, onset of the P wave until the beginning of the QRS complex, so off they'll often be the first negative deflection, which is your Q wave. And the QRS complex. Um, this again is talk is reflective of the passage of um, the electrical act activity starting at the SA node and moving through the atria into the AV node before it hits the ventricles and depolarizes the ventricles. There are some numbers that you have to remember here. So a normal PR interval is 120 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, so just remember between three and five small boxes on your ECG. Uh, and then you can have longer or shorter PR intervals. So if you have greater than 200 milliseconds or a PR interval greater than um, five small boxes, you might be looking at an instance of heart block. Um, if you have a shortened PR interval, uh, you can be looking at some uh, pre-excitation or an AV nodal rhythm, for instance, Wolf Parkinson White, uh, which I'll show you an example of a little bit later often it presents with a shortened PR interval um, and so it's worth uh, just noting that and being able to count how many boxes from the beginning, again the beginning of the P wave until the first negative deflection of the QRS. ST segment is the next bit, so our ST segment is it's meant to be this flat isoelectric portion of the ECG after the negative deflection of the S wave your ECG is always going to come up and return to uh, this I mentioned before, the J point, which is literally this little part right here. Uh, and that is this the isoelectric baseline. So with all of your positive and negative deflections in the ECG, um, there is this, if you can see my cursor here, kind of flat baseline that your waveforms will return to to kind of reestablish um, what the normal uh, voltage is, at least the reading on, on the ECG. So the J point is that point at which it returns and then the ST segment is that isoelectric area that's marked by this arrow before you have your T wave. So from the end of the S wave to the beginning of the T wave, this is the initial phase of ventricular repolarization. Um, and as you all may be well aware that ST abnormalities, elevation or depression are often seen in um, ischemic heart disease uh, and acute coronary syndromes. So that's uh, something to look at and something we always look at in the ECG because it tells us about MI. And so I just want to show you some examples of a, a, an ECG and where you might see it. All of the ST elevations are marked STE. So you can see that there's elevation in V1 and you see, if we zoom in really nicely there, um, this that I'm putting there is our baseline you can kind of see most of the ecg kind of returns to that point the this is your qrs complex here uh, and this is your st segment and you can see like this is meant to be the j point which is way elevated and then you have this upsloping st elevation and this is the t wave so that's really the picture of st 
elevation and you can see it's actually happening everywhere um, this is it again in, in v2 and in v3 conversely uh, you often find in STEMI ST depression so this again is kind of your baseline um, and you can see this is this is the QRS complex and this is is showing ST depression, that J point is not quite reaching the isoelectric baseline, um, and there's some T wave inversion here. So that's also kind of acute coronary syndrome uh, path pneumonic, so look out for ST elevation and ST depression when you're talking about STEMI. All right, so we just want to move on and give you guys some patterns to recognizing your ECGs. I think using the six step method is really great. It gives you a system. You kind of have a thought process and you can write down all of the things that you're finding. But once you've found something, how do you match that to a certain pathology or a certain disease state? So that's what we're hoping to um, give you with the common findings on ECG. Uh, and so I thought we'd start simple with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, I really like this branch um, this kind of diagram of acute coronary syndrome, uh, just starting from your main symptom, which is chest pain. So particularly when you're developing a differential um, and you, all you have is chest pain, you know, there are some absolutely key signs and symptoms for, you know, an MI. But if you need a, a wider lane, uh, you always will have cardi non-cardiac causes of chest pain. And then you'll have your cardiac causes, which are your ACS um, and then your acute coronary syndromes are then broken up into ones with or without ST elevation. So if you're going, if you have obvious ST elevation, it's always going to be a STEMI. Uh, and then if you don't have ST elevation, then you have an end STEMI perhaps or unstable angina. And I think, uh, like I said here, biomarkers are really um, key in determining the difference there. But also the presentation of unstable angina in your history will be a slightly different perhaps. Um, and this table is just giving you uh, that same framework. Uh, stable angina, you know, is, you know, chest pain on exertion that resolves with rest. Unstable angina is that chest pain that happens at rest. So often your ECG can be normal, but you can start to see some um, nonspecific uh, ST changes and, and some T wave inversion, just depending on when <laughs> it's hap when you actually are able to take the ECG. What's big to note here is that your troponins or your cardiac biomarkers are normal in stable and unstable angina as well. Uh, when you get to your STEMI and your end STEMI, so your ECG might in, in a STEMI might still look normal or you might get some ST depression and T wave inversion as well, similar to the unstable angina picture. Um, the pathophysiology is subendocardial infarct. That's your bu buzzword. So it is just that subendocardial layer uh, of muscle that's having uh, that's undergoing that ischemic injury, and you'll have elevated cardiac biomarkers, which differentiate differentiates it from the stable and unstable angina. And then, last but not least, the big bad wolf is your STEMI, and that's going to be obvious uh, ST elevation obvious ST elevation. Uh, you can also get hyperacute T waves. So you might see these big hump, like big, 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 big tall T waves um, and ST elevation that looks like this, similar to the example we showed before with the elevated biomarkers as well. <laughs> And here it, here it is. This is just a really good image from First Aid that kind of shows you exactly the views of uh, each lead of your ECG and kind of what it's pointing at and what it's directed at. So you'd be familiar with your the, this vertical circle in the vertical plane that is your limb leads. Like we said, limb 1 and AVL are lateral and then 2, 3, AVF are inferior. So you're really kind of getting the image of where how they're viewing that and then your chest leads leads one two are more anterior and then as you're moving over like five and six are getting into the lateral and they're well color coded that's kind of shown here with your in blue and your anterior septal and then you have the v3 and v4 for your distal and apical leads and then lateral and green and then inferior with two three and avf so if you have images of ST elevation or ST depression uh, and you're seeing it in certain leads like just follow the pattern uh, of this um, 
table here, and then you'll be able to kind of give an idea of where the um, where the stem is occurring, which is really helpful just to know. All right, so let's talk about arrhythmias really quickly. So uh, this is a great slide, just dividing up the supraventricular tachyarrhythmias with your ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Um, the big difference here is um, is the, is about the location of where the orig the originating impulse is coming uh, that's causing the vent the arrhythmia. Uh, and then what that means, right? So your supraventricula, it's right there in the name that any arrhythmia that's originating above the bundle of His, so in the atria or from the AV node, versus the ventricular arrhythmias, which are usually originating in the ventricle. And the biggest difference here is going to be narrow complex QRS versus broad complex QRS. Um, and so your narrow complex are going to be your SVTs, and then the broad complex are going to be the VTs. Uh, so just breaking down some patterns, atrial fibrillation, I think everybody's really well aware, like irregularly irregular is your buzzword there for AFib. Um, here's a, a half decent picture of it. And you can kind of see uh, just that the RR distances are not equal and they kind of have no pattern to them. In addition, um, the, I love this irregular baseline, uh, but you'll see in your QRSs, if you're looking for it, you don't really see P waves consistently. Like here, there's a missing P wave. Um, or, and this may look like a P wave, but it's really not clear if that is or not. So in AFib, you also, will also see a lack of a P wave. And again, that comes from the pathophysiology. Atrial flutter, uh, your buzzword there is sawtooth pattern. So if you're looking... Um, and you have a normal RR interval, I guess is the first thing to differentiate it from um, AFib, but you have multiple, as you can see here, multiple P waves um, with kind of a strange morphology. Uh, and that's just from, you know, frequent atrial depolarization, uh, some of which are not followed by ventricular depolarizations as well. And it has that sawtooth pattern. So that is how you... Uh, distinguish a flutter. Wolf Parkinson White, we talked about, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, the two key features of this, I think, are the shortened PR interval and the wide complex QRS because the PR interval is shortened. Um, so what I mean is you can kind of see here in blue, it's giving you what a normal PR interval, what a normal PR interval should be, right, before you get your the beginning of your QRS complex. Um, uh, but here in Wolf Parkinson White, uh, because there is an additional accessory pathway, there's what they call the delta wave, which shortens the PR interval, right? So the PR interval now is only this long. Um, and it uh, it's an apparent lengthening of the QRS complex because now if the QRS is starting here, now you have this complex, QRS complex that goes like this, which looks wide. So don't get that too confused, but the delta wave, the shortened PR interval, and, and an apparent wide complex QRS, um, or QRS widening, I should say, is, is the way to spot WPW. Um, and then AVNRT, this is the most common SVT. So this is another narrow complex tachycardia. Um, it's fast. You kind of like will lose your P waves in your QRS complexes. These, just to kind of give you some ideas of what it can look like, there's uh, other versions of um, re-entrant tachycardias as well, uh, but these are just to give you some ideas. Uh, you can get ST segment depression and the pseudo R waves, particular in, particularly in V1 and V2. So those are all things to look at, and this is just an image showing you um, a little bit of ST depression um, in a AVNRT picture. Then we can have a look at our ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So the big buzzword for all of these is that these are wide complex tachycardia. Um, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with some of these. Everyone pretty much knows VT, ventricular tach tachycardia. This is an erratic rhythm with multiple waveforms, wide complex QRS. Um, this is a pretty classic picture of what VT looks like. So it should be easy enough to spot. Um, and it certainly fits the bill for 
uh, ventricular arrhythmias. The other very common and very noticeable ventricular, tach ventricular tachyarrhythmia is mm. V-fib, uh, and V-fib uh, is absolutely chaotic. There's actually no discernible waveforms at all, so you really can't see any P waves, any QRS complexes, T waves, everything is kind of all over the place. Um, and the rate can be very fast, um, up to 150 to 500 beats per minute. So, uh, this, uh, is particularly dangerous because it means that there's no blood being pumped <laughs> at all. Um, so this is one of your examples of cardiac, of a type of cardiac arrest, if you will. And torsades, the points, is, uh, you know, twisting of the points. This is just another po polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, you'll usually see um, a prolonged QT interval. So that goes back to kind of looking at your QT as well. Uh, and then it'll progress into this polymorphic ventricular uh, tachyarrhythmia. Uh, and just to show you all of those in like longer strips, because I think it's easier to kind of see it, you can see the big, tall um, QRS complexes. This is the wide QRS here for ventricular arrhythmia, and you just see con constant, you know, big, tall um, QRS complexes. Uh, this is V-fib, and you can see there's no, it's just like a wavy line. There's no discernible waves at all here. This is just the heart quivering, essentially, uh, which is why the cardiac output drops to almost zero. Uh, and then you have torsade de, de points, finally, uh, which you'll see if I can try and note it for you. This is your QT interval, and like this is a very, I can just tell, you can count it out, but I can tell looking at it that this is, um, this is quite a long QT interval, might be actually longer than that. Um, and then after that, you kind of start to see this twisting pattern of the polymorphic VT, and if you draw a line through it, you know, you can kind of see that almost sine wave pattern of the twisting of the polymorphic VT. So that's torsade so that you get a good images of those three ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, let's quickly talk about heart block. Um, so there are three degrees of heart block before kinds of heart block. So first degree is quite easy to remember. Remember our PR interval is from 120 to 200 milliseconds. So in first degree heart block, you have a consistently prolonged PR interval greater than 200 milliseconds. Uh, and here's kind of what that looks like. All of the PR intervals are equal, but they're all greater than 200 milliseconds. Um, and that's it, right? That's nice and easy. In your second degree heart block, uh, the common feature for these is that there's a dropped beat. So, so you'll have a missing QRS complex on your ECG. Um, in Mobitz 1, second degree heart block type 1, this is another prolonged PR interval, but what you'll notice is the PR interval as the ECG goes along starts to get longer, so it'll always be greater than 200 milliseconds, but you'll notice that the second one is greater uh, and the second one is longer, right? So you're getting these progressively lengthening PR intervals and then you have an absent QRS complex that corresponds to a drop beat. Um, second degree heart block or second degree AV block Mobitz 2 is a little bit more similar to first degree in that the PR interval is greater than 200 milliseconds, but it's consistently prolonged. So it'll always be the same duration greater than 200 milliseconds. And then there's also a dropped beat. Uh, and then in complete hard block or third degree, there's just kind of absence of AV nodal conduction. So you have different atrial and ventricular rates. So you'll see that there are, um, you know, P waves that are not followed by QRS complexes um, or with QRS complexes that have very long <laughs> um, uh, duration before the P wave. And so there's kind of a separate rate in your atria that's, you know, determined by the the P's here, P, PP1, PP2, PP3, PP4. Um, and then you have a different rate with the ventricles that's like this RR peak is there and this RR peak is there. So there's just like no um, correspondence. That one-to-one -one ratio of your P wave to your QRS complex doesn't really exist. 
Uh, moving on to bundle branch block, uh, this, uh, not to, to complicate this, I think this is, can be easily discernible. These are both, um, examples of wide QRS complexes, um, uh, and I've just given you some images of morphology just so that you can know, uh, the concept behind the bun a, bu a bundle branch block is as your depolarization goes into the bundle of hiss and then splits into the right and left bundle branches, Right, so if you have the AV node, and then you have the bundle of hiss, and then there's a right bundle branch, and then there's a left bundle branch, and that's gonna take it to the respective ventricles. When we talk about bundle branch block, it just means that one of these pathways is blocked. So for instance, this would be the left bundle branch is blocked. And what happens when your bundle branch is blocked is, the ventricles are meant to depolarize together, and when they depolarize together on your ECG, you get, you know, one pretty, po one positive deflection or prominently positive deflection in your QRS interval. Now, in a bundle branch block, uh, what happens is your electrical activity is able to go down one pathway, like for instance here, it'll go down the right bundle branch, but the left is blocked, so this bundle branch won't pass that that electrical activity through, it actually has to kind of seep through the septum and it causes a delay. So you kind of get a picture of the right, the right ventricle depolarizes and then later on you might get the left ventricle depolarizing. So usually you kind of get this kind of mountain M-shaped or, or kind of two-hilled um, QRS complex. So that's what left the left and right bundle branch like. What we just want to show you is uh, some of what you'll see. So for instance, left bundle branch block, you have again that M shaped um, uh, R peak, uh, which is shown here. But there's a couple other morphologies, right? It can be notched, it can be monophasic. Um, but usually you'll kind of have that separated, separated um, R our, our peak point right in your QRS interval, QRS complex. Uh, dominant S wave and S1, you can lose your Q waves in lateral leads, so just something to just be cognizant of. Uh, and similarly, the <laughs> right bundle branch also has an M shape uh, more kind of defined as the RSR pattern. Um, and if this is an image of it, so this is, or RSR prime, um, R peak is here, this is your S peak, and then you have an R prime peak. Um, so this is uh, the left bundle branch depolarizing and then the right bundle branch depolarizing at a later time. And then in your lateral leads, you might also get uh, that wide S wave, which is being shown here. Uh, so those are just images of bundle branch block uh, that you can take note of. Uh, and this is uh, this is going to be in the slide, so it might be a little bit easier to see um, uh, <clears throat> in PowerPoint. But this is just kind of an overview of arrhythmias. So you have bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, and then that's broken up into all the different types of tachy and bradyarrhythmias. So this is also a really good framework to have in mind. But this is a nice, great framework to, if you're thinking about differentials, this will give you like a good pathway to a couple of differentials you can use. All right, let's try and talk a little bit about access. This comes up every year, every semester. So what does cardiac access mean? Axis, um, uh, and hopefully these images help, axis is kind of essentially defined as the mean direction of the wave vector of depolarization. So if you can imagine, this is a cross section of the heart um, and these arrows are kind of defining or, you know, representing rather depolarization. And on the right side of the heart, you have a little bit of depolarization, which is to be expected. Um, the right side of the heart is not as big and muscular. It doesn't have the same um, afterload pressure that the left side does. So you have a lot more depolarization energy on the left side um, of the heart because that it needs it, right? So it means that all of the vectors, um, this is taking you back to physics perhaps, but all of the vectors of depolarization are added and the summation of that vector creates what 
is being highlighted here, which is this mean QRS vector, um, uh, which points a little bit downwards and to the left. So that's uh, giving you a normal axis, but that's also the definition of axis is just the mean vector of all of the depolarization energy, uh, which means that due to certain pathologies or th certain changes, uh, your axis can change. And then that's where we start to get uh, talk about axis deviation. Uh, but just to talk about normal axis first, um, like I said, the normal axis points down and to downward and to the left. Uh, so you have a normal range of minus 30 to minus 90. So that's this area that's um, in green on this side of the circle of axis. Um, and we're looking at this, the, the circle that's created is in the vertical plane. So similar to uh, when we were talking earlier about what our, where our leads are placed and what views we're getting of the heart. So think of your limb leads there. So lead one, AVL, AVF, lead three, lead two. So those are the ones that are giving us that picture. So focus on the limb leads um, and those will be the ones that are kind of helpful in determining your axis. And then when axis is pathological, you can have left axis deviation. So here in yellow, anything that's greater, less than minus 30, so minus 30 to minus 90. And then right axis deviation is just the opposite side. Anything above 90, plus 90, up to plus 180. And then the extreme axis in purple um, is greater than um, 180, so that area uh, from kind of minus 150 to minus 90 to minus 150, but we'll just focus on right and left axis deviation, normal axis. But just remember your normal axis is minus 30 to minus 90, which makes sense because again, we said that your axis kind of points downward. If this is your mean axis in red, it points downward and to the left. So somewhere in that range is always going to be a normal axis um, for you. And then your limb leads are going to be the ones that are going to tell you what the axis is. So this is just another visual way to think about axis. So like I said, limb leads are really helpful. So lead one, lead two, uh, lead three, and lead AVF, I think are the most important ones. Uh, these spheres are just kind of giving you an idea. Lead one has a positive electrode to the left. So if you imagine the um, area of axis is a sphere around the heart. Everything towards pointing towards to the left is positive, which is all this area in yellow. And then on the other side of it, again, remember we said depolarization, moving away from an electrode is gonna be negative. So you kind of have all of the negative side of the sphere over there. Similarly, AVF points directly down um, at 90 degrees. So everything below AVF, that's the positive side of the electrode, which is here in blue. And then above it is anything that's negative again, because of that rule of how depolarization follows. So if you imagine these two overlapped spheres, they kind of make an area of positive and an area of negative um, region. And that kind of also is going to help us determine the axis. And then if you're looking at this circle again, like here you have a normal axis in green, um, and because both lead one and AVF are positive, def positive, right, in this area, then in your ECG, you should see two positive deflections in these two leads. Um, and that is going to be a normal axis for you. And that's just because, again, the positive, the electrode is reading positive as the energy from the heart is moving into that direction, which is your... Um, normal axis again between that roughly minus 30 and plus 90. So if we start with left axis deviation, um, three lead analysis is a really good way to think about it. So lead one and AVF are probably the pro predominant ones, but leads two and three can also be very helpful. Um, so left axis deviation is always going to be positive in lead one. If you can remember again, lead one is positive on the left side. So it's left axis deviation. So that'll still be positive. That's kind of indicated here, uh, this circle here, this is where lead one is and it's moved to the positive side, right? Um, lead two points downwards. Um, and in left axis deviation, you'll have a, a more negative, this yellow half of the circle, you'll have a, a negative uh, 
negative deflection and it's the negative side of that lead and then similarly AVF points directly down uh, at plus 90 and so you'll get a deflection into minus 90 so if you put all these three things together this purple region defines your left axis deviation pointing upwards and to the left which is kind of the opposite we said normal axis points to the left and downwards so you're still pointing to the left which is why lead one is positive but because it's upwards instead of downwards lead two and avf are negative and if you look at the ecg example we've put here you have positive deflection in lead one which is good, is to be expected. And then in AVF and lead two, which were our other two leads we looked at, you can see the QRS is predominantly negatively defle deflected. So you can say with confidence that, okay, it is pointing to the left, but rather than pointing downward, it's pointing upward, which means that it's pointing away from those inferior leads, and that's giving you a negative deflection, and that's left axis deviation. And then right axis deviation um, is similar. You can use another three lead analysis using lead one, lead two, and AVF again. Now the opposite here is right axis deviation. Uh, the For lead one, it's the opposite to left, right? So we said that lead one is positive to the left, but in right axis deviation, the you're moving to the right. So it's negative in lead one. Um, and then you'll have positive in um lead to an avf so it's it's this image that's pointing to the right and and inferiorly downward that's your right axis deviation and similarly in the ecg it's a little bit hard to see in lead one but the predominant aspect of the qrs complex here is negative and then you have kind of nice big positive deflections in the inferior leads two, three, and AVF. So you can say it is not pointing to the left because you'd expect that to be positive in lead one. It's pointing away from it. So that's negative. And then your inferior leads are positive because it's going a little bit downward. And so that is, you know, right axis deviation 90 to 150 degrees is where that sits. So hopefully that clears axis up a little bit. And as always, we always love to plug where we get all of our information and where a lot of our learning comes from. So if you want more practice or you want more things explained, uh, Life in the Fast Lane is a phenomenal place to go. They have a huge library of ECGs that walks you through um, all of the different types of um, ECG findings by disease and by pathology, and it, it really has a good way of explaining it. So if you want more practice um, or more clarification, you can always check it out there. And now it's time to put it all together and do some practice. Beep.